Good afternoon, everybody. My name is MJ Tui, and I'm Associate Vice President for Academic Affairs and the Executive Director of the Health Sciences Library. And today, I'd like to welcome you to the end of one era and the beginning of another. Uh, today, we are actually officially completing our 200th anniversary celebration and beginning what we hope will be an occasional series called What's Next, that will be exploring a lot of the uh, frontiers of what we do here at UMB. The Health Sciences and Human Services Library has been celebrating its 200th anniversary for the past two years. During that time, we have hosted talks, parties, exhibits, breakfasts, lunches, dinners. We've added paintings to our collection, all to celebrate every aspect of what the culture is that our library functions in. So it hasn't just been about the library, but more about our community in the broadest sense and our thoughts and the knowledge that underpin the work we actually do here at UMB and beyond. And it's the work we have done, the work we are doing, the work we still have to do. And we've learned a lot in the process. We've engaged in conversations, we've shared ideas, and we've gotten excited for our future. We started the 200th celebration with a talk by Dr. Phil Makoviak, and some of you were there, I recognize the faces. And he reflected on the life and work of Dr. John Crawford, whose collection actually founded our library in uh, 1813, and actually was the founding, which caused us to be the founding library system in the University of Maryland, period. So we even marched to his grave that day, flowers in hand, to lay the flowers on his grave and to honor him. But today we're looking to the future as we close out our two years of celebration. With this, our last official event, we're also announcing that we're establishing a semi-regular, I'm not going to make any commitments, semi-regular series called What's Next, which is going to be focused on exciting developments shaping the future of health, health science, health care, and the human condition. We're not interested in the status quo or the here and the now. We want to cast our vision even further forward to those who are cutting on the cutting, maybe even on the bleeding edge, challenging that status quo, advancing ideas, people who are thought-provoking, and perhaps even a little dangerous. These are the people we're ask, that, who are asking the question, what if and why not? I think you'll find that our speaker today, Dr. Ellen Jorgensen, fits those descriptions, dangerous especially. But before I introduce her, I need to issue some thanks to some people in the room. First of all, today's talk was funded through an award by the National Network of Libraries of Medicine, Southeastern Atlantic Region. Thank you very much. And second, I need to thank the members of the TF200, or Task Force 200, the internal HSHSL group that's been working over the past, actually, three years to plan staff events, local events, community events, write press releases, go to parties, it's hard work. All the while, they've been oozing creativity and excitement for whatever tasks they've done. So thank you, and I know a lot of them are there, and so I'm asking them, can you believe this is over after two years? And so I'm thinking big celebration. So would all the members of the Task Force 200 please stand? Come on. I know you're here. Thank you. <laughs> and now to our inaugural What's Next speaker, Dr. Ellen Jorgensen. Dr. Jorgensen is a molecular biologist and a passionate advocate for citizen science. She attended Columbia University and New York University where she earned her doctorate in molecular biology, and she says, this is the best time ever to be a molecular biologist. Her research interests are very diverse, from free radicals in disease, DNA fingerprinting, virus protein structures and relationships, and cancer biomarkers. Dr. Jorgensen is the founder, co-founder and executive director of GenSpace, which is a nonprofit community laboratory dedicated to promoting citizen science and access to biotechnology. And she's currently adjunct faculty at New York Medical College. She's scientist in residence at the School of Visual Arts and a visiting professor at the Cooper Union. She's a noted expert on biohacking and citizen science. And hopefully, some of you watched her 2012 TED Talk, which was included in a lot of the materials, called Biohacking, You Can Do It Too, which was invigorating, exciting, and really thought-provoking. And it, received over, it has received to date over a million views. I believe 2,000 of those are my views alone. Um, so I hope you had a chance to view it. My favorite part was the opening, or was in close to the opening, where she showed two images 
a bench scientist, you know, with their tubes and everything else, and a regular person in a t-shirt saying, stand back, I'm going to try science. And I think you're going to actually probably use that today, too, because that is the coolest image. Um, she surmised we'd probably be more comfortable with the lab scientists doing the science. However, that's not what she believes. And see, she is so well known that in an advertisement that went out to some of the citizen science community here in Baltimore, their headline was, Ellen is coming, and they didn't mean Ellen DeGeneres. <laughs> so let's hear it for Dr. Jorgensen. She tells us about community labs as centers of innovation and learning. Thank you. Okay. Well, th well thank you so much. And uh, congratulations on 200 years. That's amazing. I hope Gen Space lasts even 20. <laughs> um, if I'd have known you wanted to be dangerous, uh, I probably would have titled the talk something a little bit more dangerous. But um, I wasn't quite sure. I knew I was coming to a library, so I didn't want to overly alarm anyone. Um, uh, I am a molecular biologist, but I'm also a biohacker. And that term doesn't really have a clear description. It, it's been used by people to mean anything from somebody who does a bacterial transformation and turns E. coli green to someone who implants RFID chips in their hand and turns on lights by waving their hands. So it's not a very exact definition. But what I mean is I'm actually trying to hack the science of biology ex itself in terms of the way that it's done, who does it, who has access to it. And the reason that I'm doing it is I believe that we're at a crossroads right now. There, there's a lot of things wrong with the academic system as it stands and the corporate system. There are a lot of funding bottlenecks. There's a lot of good research that isn't getting funded. And a lot of it is because I don't think the public really understands the importance of some of the research that gets done. Because in the end, as an academic, we're funded by the public and we serve the public by our research. And uh, it's getting a little better, but certainly there was a period around 2008 when I co-founded GenSpace around then where um, we had a president that didn't believe in either evolution or global warming. <laughs> and science funding was way, way down. And uh, it's looking up a little bit, but because of the economic downturn, we're still struggling. And the peer review system is under attack because it's not working all that well. And so, I think we have to look, especially with the next generation of scientists, at how they're going to do science, where they're going to do science, and what's going to inspire them and how they're going to get trained. We also have to think a lot more now about what the general public thinks of our work. So, for example, uh, I don't know if any of you have taken, um, Alan Alda is giving a class for people to communicate science, uh, to teach scientists how to talk to people. Um, in, in words and, and in, in, um, in emotion that will actually excite them about the science. Because most scientists are not really good at communicating what they do to the general public in a way that gets them excited. And the ones that are usually become some sort of superstars on TV, like that physicist who seems to be on every channel that I turn on. <laughs> so um, so I, I think that, that this is just an introduction to why you should be even in this room listening to me talk. <laughs> uh, I think it's important to be aware of some of these other um, avenues that are opening up and the importance that they may play uh, in your work and especially in the work of the students that you're teaching or your children. So let's see if I can get this to work. So what is a community lab? Well. This was one of the first pieces of press about us. This was Science Magazine in 2012. They did a section on synthetic biology. And I was really happy. We were, we were sandwiched between George Church and BioArt. And essentially, it's a lab of your own. If you want to do an experiment, or you have an idea, or you're curious, and you want to find, more, uh, more, uh, find out more about something, there's no way that you can just walk into a biology lab and do it. The lab is usually part of a university or worse yet, part of a corporation. 
And no one is going to let you just walk in unless you're either a student, an employee, or you're in a highly supervised, highly choreographed exercise of some sort. And people started to question this. The, 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 the things that came together around 2008 were uh, the maker movement was getting larger and larger. Electronic hacker spaces, uh, computer hacker spaces were popping up in, in every city where people pooled their resources and bought something like a laser uh, cutter or a 3D printer. The other thing was that DNA became cheaper and cheaper and there was a lot of used equipment uh, especially during the economic downturn, uh, a lot of PCR machines and things like that are just got dumped on eBay and you could get them for a hundred bucks. So they became accessible. And the third was this interesting area. How many of you are aware of the field of synthetic biology? I'm just curious. Wow. <laughs> I'm going to be speaking at a conference uh, Friday, a synthetic biology uh, summit in New York and I will tell them that of a room full of people, only three people, so they have a big job in communicating their field. Uh, essentially it's, it's, a, uh, it's this, the next step from genetic engineering and recombinant DNA as we've done it for the past 30 years. It's, it's, it's an effort to make it more high throughput and more accessible to other scientists. So it, it was conceived of by engineers and computer scientists who said wouldn't it be great if we could look at DNA pieces as standardized parts, we could fit them together like Legos, and we could write specifications for them so it would be easier for someone who didn't want to drill down all the way to the DNA sequence to be able to stick uh, a promoter in front of um, an open reading frame or whatever and mix and match things. And not only that, once you start writing standards for things and making them assemblable, then you can automate the process. And one example of that is the molecular foundry at the Broad Institute where they're tackling the, um, the genes that are, are making up um, nitrogen fixation, which is a horrendously complicated system. But they're churning out, you know, uh, 400 iterations at a time and testing them all simultaneously. So uh, this high throughput science and also this abstraction of the DNA code was something that um, they, they promoted with a competition called the International Genetically Engineered Machine Competition, or iGEM. It started with eight teams in a classroom at MIT. It's now over 250 teams from all over the world, and we take over the Heinz Convention Center every year. And so a lot of the students, it's a student competition, or at least it started that way. A lot of the students that went through iGEM, once they graduated, if they were majoring in uh, you know, engineering or computer science, which a lot of them were, they kind of missed the biology part and they thought, well, gee, we were working with safe organisms like E. coli K12 and why can't we do this, uh, continue to do this as a hobby the same way that in hacker spaces you brew beer or you, you know, make kombucha. And so they started exploring that possibility and that was the beginning of what was known as the DIY bio movement. Uh, how many of you heard of DIY bio? Okay, well, that's better. <laughs> See, my movement is better at communicating to the general public than a, an entire academic field. And that's another thing that's really important, is because we're grassroots and we are kind of edgy and we get into the newspapers all the time, we end up as the mouthpieces explaining to people what synthetic biology is. So it's really crazy. It, it's, it, it's a very, very clear illustration of how this sort of grassroots communication can, can really help regular mainstream science. So this is, this is the Carlson curve. So if you, if you know Moore's law, which is that the, the, the transistors, um, in, in the power of computers um, doubles every so and so years, uh, you can see right away that there's this precipitous drop and it's continuing to drop. I mean, this is 2013, this is old news in the sequencing of DNA for sure, but also in the synthesis. So when we first started GenSpace, you could buy 500 nucleotides for I think $99. Now you can buy over a thousand. So every year it kind of gets cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. Also uh, there are other assembly systems 
rather than just using the things that we used in the past, like restriction endonucleases and ligases, you have things like Gibson Assembly, and now uh, all of the major biotech suppliers like New England Biolabs are falling all over each other to find even faster and cheaper ways to get you to assemble DNA. So the end game, which is going to be kind of strange for people like me who spent their whole career like doing this stuff, wet work at the bench, is going to be doing it on a computer and then the manufacture of the DNA may be a total fee-for-service thing. So the whole landscape is changing in, in this field right now. This is uh, from the DIY Bio website. Um, it's a, uh, uh, everybody is self-reporting that they're doing DIY Bio, and for some reason Asia didn't get on this map. But you can see that there are a lot of people that are saying that they're involved in this in some way. And this was a survey that the Wilson Policy Center did last year, where uh, the thing I want you to see is that most of the people that have been doing this have only been doing it for the last year or so. So the movement is really, really growing. It started with a handful of labs across the United States and a few in Europe, and it's, it's really starting to take off. It probably, I pro probably doesn't go more than uh, a week that I don't get somebody emailing me and saying that they want to start a lab and they want advice. So that, that's just showing the power of this idea spreading. And most of the people that are doing this work are doing either education, personal, just sort of personal hobby type exploration or basic discovery. Some of them are developing tools and being entrepreneurial and some of them are even doing artistic stuff. But uh, really, th I think that's the best use for some of these labs. We're, you know, we're not going to compete with, with you know, uh, Merck or, uh, <laughs> or Pfizer. We're not going to do a lot of really um, resource-intensive biomedical research. But there are other areas such as biomaterials, biosensors, even diagnostics that perhaps you will see some inventions out of these labs. And I'm going to talk a little bit, bit about that later. And when people were asked where they practiced, uh, obviously some of them practice in multiple places because if you add these up, it doesn't add up to 100. But fully, um, almost 70% are doing it in either a hackerspace or a community lab, at least some, of, some part of the time. So they're being exposed, this is very important, to a community culture and code of ethics. And I think that's one of the most important reasons for these spaces to exist because if we have sort of a shared code of ethics, peer pressure, if you will, that everything that you do in the lab should be something that is awesome and wonderful and helpful and not something weird and creepy and dangerous and something safe rather than something unsafe, then you're going to get more people doing this practice in that manner. And if you make it interesting enough, if you give them enough cool opportunities, uh, anyone who might be sort of on the edge uh, will be lured, hopefully, into, um, into this more, uh, now I'm, I'm sorry if I'm not being edgy enough, but a more kinder and gentler biohacking than maybe what was envisioned in the very beginning where the newspapers were, were talking about Frankenstein in the basement. We, we want to avoid Frankenstein in the basement. We deliberately work with organisms that are biosafety level one. So nobody is working with pathogens, nobody is working with anything that uh, causes any human disease. And uh, really, if you think about it, um, and, and believe me, I've spent a lot of time with Homeland Security people, because we had to engage that community right away when we set up the lab. And they're, they're pretty amazing people. But they understand also that it's, it's, it's pretty hard to create a bioweapon. It's not the sort of thing that you can do accidentally in a community lab. So they are actually not concerned at all about us. They, they view us as, um, as helpful in that we're training more people to recognize when they look at something what it is. We've actually trained their agents to walk into a lab and see the difference between a meth lab and a bio lab. You know, <laughs> Ooh, lots of glassware and, you know, heating things and coils versus lots of plastic and petri plates and incubators. So um, that's been a very interesting journey for me. 
This is, um, this is Gen Space. It's really a funky space. It's in a building that is run by a very eccentric guy who has a dream of a cooperative building with all these creative businesses in it. And we were very lucky to find this home. He built us that glass enclosed space, which is our main lab, in three days out of old sliding glass doors. The um, benches are all, I said, we have to have something that's non-absorbent to be biosafety level one. So he found all these stainless steel restaurant counters and put them in, and they work great. Uh, especially because you can write on them with the magic markers. You can write your protocol on the bench and then squirt alcohol on it and take it off when you're done. And, uh, and so we, we, we started out with that space and now we have three other uh, spaces of approximately, it's only about 10 feet by 15 feet. But a lot of labs, you know, in uh, say the NIH are probably that small too. So, um, and then we have this very messy office area. Uh, people who see the slide say, oh, you should take a slide where it's not quite so messy, but this is kind of what it looks like. And the other great thing about the building owner is he's um, an architectural pack rat, so uh, all of the chairs are mismatched. They're chairs that Al found somewhere. Um, all the desks and everything was just, just salvaged from other parts of the building. So if you need anything, um, anything from a fish tank to a mannequin arm to a camel saddle, Al will have it somewhere in the building. <laughs> so it's very convenient. This is uh, some students working in the lab. And obviously, that's one of the main purposes for these labs that they serve very well, is that there really isn't enough opportunity for students at the high school or the college level, at least not in New York, to come in and actually do hands-on research. They get herded into classrooms, they do an activity where everyone already knows what the answer is supposed to be, or uh, it's just a very limited set of questions, and then um, they're graded on whether or not they got the right answer. In this case, if they're actually trying to do something that either has never been done before, or they've never done before, or they're not sure how it's gonna work out, we've, we've got testimonials from them saying, it's, it's a lot more exciting. It's, it's, you, one of the students said you become really personally involved in the work. You really care whether or not the answer comes out okay. Because it, it's not guaranteed. And you're crossing your fingers and you want to come in the next day and see if you got any colonies, if you did a transformation. And it's a lot different than a classroom exercise. And there, there, there are precious few places to do that kind of stuff. Or if they do it, and this is a big beef of mine, how many times have you uh, talked to a high school student that's done research in a, P, you know, a lab in a, in a university like biomedical? They all want to do biomedical research. And then you say, well, what do you do? And they said, well, um, we set up PCR reactions or we did ELISA plates. And you say, okay, well, what, were you, what was the lab doing? And they'll say, uh, something, it was something about pancreatic cancer. I, I don't really know exactly what it was, but it was something. And they have no idea what the research was in the lab. They were just used as a pair of hands to do something menial. And that drives me nuts. So at GenSpace, the projects are, by necessity, um, much simpler and much more understandable. And yeah, you know, they're not building a, a Mercedes. They're building a go-kart but they get an idea of how you build a moving vehicle and that, that can then go and help them boost to the next level. Like this kid in the foreground, Jackie, is now working. Um, he, he graduated from high school and he um, went to Columbia University. And I called up a professor I knew at Columbia PNS at the medical school and said, do you have any room in your lab for, for a student? And so now he's working in this guy's lab doing real synthetic biology. And believe me, people are really happy to get a student who already knows how to pipette, who already knows how to use an analytical balance, who already knows how to do a bacterial transformation, how to do PCR, how to do all these things. So you can give your students or the people in your community an advantage by um, providing a space where they can learn these skills. Because let's face it, <laughs> yeah, you have the online courses, 
But there's a reason why a PhD is embedded in a lab for four years. There's a lot of physical skills, even using a pipetter and figuring out how to use it and, and where to stop when you put pressure on it. It's something that you actually have to go and get your hands dirty with. Of course, we also, when we started out, did a lot of public outreach. We wanted our name to be out there. Uh, I've done more strawberry DNA extractions at street fairs that I care, than I care to admit. Um, by the end of them, you never want to see a strawberry again because you're covered in strawberry juice and everything smells like strawberries. But it is a really good way to introduce people to DNA, both the kids and their parents. And it can start all sorts of interesting conversations. Like some of them say, well, what can you do with this DNA? And then you can, it opens the door to talking about all sorts of things from banking genomes to genetic engineering and, um, and, and personal genomics. Uh, this was one of the first events we did, and it was a, it was a street, uh, like a, a street fair, but it was also a green market, so we had people extracting the DNA from their fruits and vegetables. And I think that was the first time we realized that something that simple could be really a good way to engage the public in dialogue. Um, of course, we have partnered now. Uh, the Urban Barcode Project is a DNA barcoding project. Uh, barcoding is just um, identifying species through DNA patterns rather than uh, old-fashioned taxonomy where you have to know uh, all these Latin words and you have to compare how things look physically. Uh, barcoding is nice because the sequence is the sequence. So if you get a barcode sequence and you compare it to a database, you can do an ID even if you have no uh, background in taxonomy at all. And so these students were bringing in all sorts of things. These girls actually were bringing in those sort of mystery meats from the supermarket, like hot dogs that were supposed to be beef, but they weren't sure, and pot pies. And uh, the scariest was McDonald's filet of fish but we won't go there. <laughs> uh, we also um, open ourselves up to the general public, which uh, um, I think I probably am going to need two different sets of pipetters at some point. <laughs> Uh, but um, people are really fascinated just uh, with the idea of moving little bits of liquid from one tube to the other and knowing they're doing something. So we have this PCR and pizza night and sometimes we do sort of personal genomics PCR where they isolate DNA from their cheek cells and test it for something. And sometimes we do some of the plants from the Alaska barcoding project, which I'll talk about later. But the idea is these are people that walk in off the street, they have some of them no knowledge at all, and here's a chance for you to talk to them. And then you also get people that uh, want to see GenSpace coming on that night. You get people who are volunteers at GenSpace, and often the most important part of the night is the conversations that start forming around all these different groups of people and the connections that are formed. And that's one thing I'm really proud of is, is sort of that the lab becomes a nexus of all these different um, the, the professional community, the amateur community, the artistic community, what I call the Discovery Channel crowd community that have seen it on TV and want to do it hands-on, the types that take my classes and in the breaks they're on the cell phone going, yes, yes, I'm working with bacteria. <laughs> so speaking of the adult classes, we were the first to offer classes to adults. So this means people that have absolutely no um, background, we assume no background at all. Most people who are not in the scientific field took their last science class in high school, don't remember it at all. But uh, it's interesting that, that the buzz around DNA is reaching a lot of different fields. One of the things that surprised me was that the, the primary users of the space in the beginning were artists. Of course, New York is one of the art capitals of the world, but I didn't realize that bio art was hot. And so we got this influx of people that knew there was something there. They weren't sure why they needed to know it, but they wanted to come and muck around with DNA. We also get people, um, a lot of people from um, computer science. Uh, I guess they are sick of, of uh, programming machines. They want to program life as the next thing. They may have heard something about synthetic biology. We also get a lot of people that um, are peripheral to uh, biologists, so we get um, patent attorneys, we get venture capitalists even, we get um, bioinformatics people that have never done any wet work. So we get people that are supporting biologists but 
want to know a little bit more what exactly th these words are that the biologists keep throwing around. So these are some of the classes that we've been teaching on a fairly regular basis. Um, so they get to do the hello world experiment. They get to take E. coli and put a fluorescent gene from a jellyfish or coral into it and turn it a pretty color. Uh, we also were, I think, one of the first groups to actually submit abstracts to scientific meetings. Granted, they were more on the educational value of the space, but um, I think we're gearing up to submit our first scientific ex, um, abstract to a meeting, um, uh, a project I'll tell you about in, in a couple of minutes. We also were the first to host an iGEM team. So that competition I told you about, we, in 2011, it, at that point, you had to partner with an academic institution to be allowed in. They have, because of our involvement, They've since changed the regulations, and now they have a separate community lab track, which is really exciting. Uh, we've given workshops all over the world. This was a workshop in Cairo, Egypt, as part of Maker Faire Africa. Um, unfortunately, uh, you know, it was before, it was, at, it was between the first Arab Spring uprising and the second demonstration where everything um, started to really go downhill there. But um, I was lucky enough to be able to visit Egypt, something I'd always wanted to do before um, it got, I think, too dangerous to go there. This is what drives me. Uh, I really don't like it when um, somebody who appears to be very well educated and smart says something like, I would never eat a genetically engineered tomato. You know there's DNA in it. So <laughs> I swear to God, I do hear that. One of our own co-founders, who's an artist, came up to me during the H5N1 and said, is it safe to get the flu vaccine or will it make me sick? And I said, I just got both in the same day, the normal one on one arm and the H5N1 on the other, go get your flu vaccine. So um, it's, I think it's very important that you don't lecture people that you engage people uh, in a neutral space. So that although there's nothing wrong with all the great outreach programs that institutions do, for example, we partner a lot with Rockefeller Universities. I'm gonna actually be doing Science Saturday with them um, in a couple of weeks. But to get to Science Saturday, you walk past the guard at the gate, you walk into this campus, there are all these buildings, there are people hurrying back and forth that you know are all scientists, you come into this area that is obviously an environment that you don't see in your daily life, and you're on Rockefeller's turf. You're not on your own turf. And you have these people that you're trusting, and most people do trust scientists if you see the surveys. We, we've got a pretty, pretty good record in terms of, you know, politicians and lawyers are kind of at the bottom, but scientists are, you know, right up there, one or two with like ministers and things like that. People do trust us. But in specific instances, especially some of these very emotionally charged issues like vaccination, I think it's important to have the conversation kind of within a community space of some sort. It just, it seems to help, what can I say? And it's hard to get scared of genetic engineering if you're doing it in a space like GenSpace that doesn't look scary at all, and if you're doing it with your kid. Um, truth to tell, Bacterial transformation is part of the AP biology curriculum in the United States, but most people would, don't even know that, you know? Sometimes their kids come in with them and they say, oh yeah, I've done that, and their parents are just totally shocked because obviously they're not communicating with their kids very well, but then, you know, I didn't say very much to my parents about what I did in school except, uh, fine, when I was a teenager. Oops. So, Central to the mission, and these are two of the guys who are credited with actually founding this movement. I didn't found the movement. Um, I just saw the value of it. Uh, was that better public understanding benefits, benefits everyone. And so uh, the people that founded GenSpace met on this Google group called DIY Bio. We were the first to actually open a lab, and part of that illustrates that it's, it's good to have at least one professional scientist in the group because 
you know what you can get done. I've set up labs before, and to me it wasn't intimidating. I knew what I had to do. I knew I had to, you know, find the local biohazardous waste company. I had to, you know, set up accounts with VWR, and, you know, we had to incorporate. Stuff like that, that um, if you're just coming from uh, total amateur, it's hard. So uh, you do actually have a lab right in the Baltimore area called the um, Baltimore Underground Science uh, Space, or BUGS. And I encourage you to support them by um, donating your expertise and your time and referring people there. Because these spaces benefit tremendously by uh, not somebody actually run it. It's not necessary for a professional scientist to run it, but to help set it up and um, to help provide some content in it. Because you guys are the ones that have all the cutting edge discoveries. So we want to hear what you're saying. The general public wants to hear it, but they don't want to come to the lab to hear it. They want you to come to their, their space and, and tell them in words they can understand what you're doing and why it's so cool. Everybody, I think, has the right to do some self-exploration, as long as they're not. Our rule at GenSpace is um, we, we have a membership. It's like a hacker space. It's $100 a month. We try to keep the price point low. It gives you access to the lab and all the machinery and some consumable supplies. And the reason is we think everyone has the right to do experiments that are safe and play around with the stuff. And who knows? They might invent something. You can't discount that. So our only rule is whatever you have to do has to be safe and you're not being excessively annoying to anybody else because after all, we are a community. So we started out actually in a kitchen and uh, I borrowed some lab equipment and we were doing gel electrophoresis on a kitchen table. Um, we then moved into a corner of an electronic hacker space in the area called New York City Resistor. And that's a pretty typical trajectory. A lot of electronic hacker spaces. For example, in Boston, there's a space called Sprout. And um, Boss Lab is uh, in a corner on, of Sprout, their, their community lab. But we really wanted to have our own space because we had people that really had project ideas and wanted to carry them through. And some of the first people, as I said, were artists. This is a really amazing woman named Heather Dewey Hagborg. And she was sitting in a doctor's office and she saw this hair dangling from a picture frame. And she started thinking of all the shows she's seen on television like CSI where they could tell all this stuff. So she started wondering, well, what can I tell about this person that I don't even know from this hair? And so she came to GenSpace and she asked about DNA an analysis. And she had a certain amount of money. She had a grant from iBeam, which is an arts organization in New York. And what she ended up doing was making a bunch of PCR primers to amplify regions of the DNA that had to do with appearance. And we're learning more and more and more about that. So the genes that code for facial shape, for hair and eye color, for freckles, things like that. But also, there's a lot of um, data on ethnicity because of mitochondrial DNA sequencing and mitochondrial haplotypes. And of course, you can tell if someone is male or female by whether or not they have a Y chromosome. So there's a lot you can find out. So what she did was she got a series of primers, went out on the street, collected cigarette butts and chewing gum from random locations in New York, bought uh, a kit to extract the DNA. So it wasn't anything that was terribly difficult. It was just something that you had to be very precise about. And she managed to analyze the DNA of half a dozen different people that she'd never met, took the information gained from those sequences, fed it into a program that she wrote that went out on the internet and found faces that matched that characteristic. So if, if, if it said that the person was um, Hispanic with brown eyes and female and likely overweight, they would find faces like that. And then the program pulled them all into a, a composite in a 3D modeling program, which she would then tweak a little until she got what she wanted and sent it off and had it 3D printed. And the result were these creepy, creepy things that looked like death masks. And below them, she would display the piece of chewing gum or cigarette butt and the location where she found it. So, you know, Penn Station or the corner of Maple and Vine. Mm -hmm. And what she wanted you to think about was, was were you anywhere in the area? Could this have been your DNA? Could someone else have access to this information? And by the way, the information um, governing appearance is still not that it's not that accurate 
but we have much better data on biomedical conditions. So if she had chosen to examine it instead for what this person's tendency towards diabetes was, or whether or not they carried a, a, a cystic fibrosis recessive mutation, she would have been able to tell that with 100% certainty. So that was what she was trying to point out. And this work generated, this taught me a lesson, because I was, ah, oh, science communication, I'm telling everyone how powerful DNA is and how it's bleeding into every aspect of their lives. If you look at the mentions of the word genspace in the popular press, right at the time this project comes out, there's this spike that dwarfed, dwarfed my TED talk, dwarfed everything that ever happened before that. And it was because the, 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 just seeing this face and this piece of chewing gum was so emotionally arresting and so creepy that it generated a tremendous amount of attention. And this is now um, becoming more and more of real science. There are companies that have just opened that are selling their services to law enforcement agencies, taking DNA from crime scenes and generating um, potential faces out of it. The only face that I saw that uh, she did um, kind of because someone asked her to do it without looking uh, was a producer at CNN, I think, and it was creepy. The, the face could have been his son, uh, because all her faces are about 20 years old. She, can't, she, she couldn't do telomeres, so she couldn't tell age. And this guy was older. But it really, it really showed a relationship. So it was, it was quite amazing. Um, another use, early use, was um, sometimes someone had an experiment that they just needed to do something they couldn't do anywhere else. So try, if you have an invention and you have to grow up some flasks of E. coli, um, the K-12, which is the strain that they use in all teaching labs, um, it's been used for 40 years, it's perfectly safe, but try and get a lab to let you in on a temporary basis so you can run some proof of principle experiments. There's no place for that. You either go and, and uh, you've got a biotech incubator space that wants you to commit to a lease for a year for $1,000 a month, um, or they want you to become part of their organization or whatever. So there was, there was definitely a need to do something um, about this lack of space for innovation. Uh, obviously, uh, high school teachers and their students, um, if the teacher is not, wants to do something that is more cutting edge, and they know about it in principle, but they either don't have the equipment in their school or they're a little bit uncertain about their ability to carry through. It's a great space to work in. Uh, we went from um, doing very simple things to actually teaching synthetic biology with this uh, Genomicon kit, which is one of, um, an iGEM team invented this. That box has a bunch of different DNA parts that you can literally mix and match, and they're all pre pre-prepared for you. So it's an introduction to um, high throughput uh, modular, modular biology. And we are now, uh, because we've become known for, for trying new things and what we try becomes public because we're so public, the, the makers of the kit are now giving us beta versions where they've got 57 different parts with different um, sort of on and off signals for the genes and different reporters. So you can really start to build your own biological circuits, all in a very simple format. It could, it could be used down to the high school level easily. Um, we started out doing corporate workshops once in a while. This was a group from Google. And um, that lady who's next to me sort of kneeling down, uh, I was so dumb, I had no idea. She went through the whole exercise wearing Google glasses, and I had no idea what they were. <laughs> I felt like an idiot afterward. Uh, she let me try them on. Um, eh. They'd be nice if you were at the bench and you wanted to have a protocol sort of floating in front of you. And every time you went through a step, you could say, OK, check off step one. That would be nice. But um, I don't think they're really very useful for much else. So I'm not surprised that they didn't take off at a price tag of $1,500. This, though, has morphed now into next week, I'm hosting a group from a venture capital firm. So these spaces went from spaces that were, the Google group came for entertainment. We did a bioluminescent bacteria exercise. The venture capitalists are thinking about investing in synthetic biology. Now think about it. 
here's this community space, and I'm influencing, apparently this is one of the biggest venture capital firms in New York, and they're coming to GenSpace to get their first hands-on taste of a field that they may invest in. So that's huge. Um, another thing that started out sort of, um, I'd say very casual, was uh, I love Alaska. I have property in Alaska in Wrangell St. Elias National Park, which is, if you ever get a chance to go there, it's one of the most beautiful places on Earth. It's a World Heritage Site. It's virtually untouched land. There are no trails. You want to go hike there, uh, you hire a bush plane, it drops you out in the middle of nowhere, gives you a map, and you have to hike 20 miles to the next airstrip. And so I thought one nice community engagement around barcoding would be to do a survey of some of the plants in this remote valley because uh, Alaska is a very fragile ecosystem. And it's, it's, it's very, um, I, it's ironic to me that you've got these plants that survive these minus 50 below winters and yet global warming is threatening to kill them because the climate is changing and they won't be able to adapt fast enough. So we started the Alaska Barcode Project in um, 2012, and we've done two collections, and we often do it uh, at that um, open barcoding night. And this is all we do. We have them extract the DNA and do PCR, then we send it out for sequencing, and we look to see if the barcode is in the database, and if it isn't, we, you know, we try to provide it. So it's a good, uh, short, hands-on activity for the general public. Well, now this has morphed into the Gowanus Canal Project. So one of our members lives near the Gowanus Canal, and if you don't know what that is, it is a super fun, super fun site. Um, it's uh, an area that is very hip in Brooklyn. The canal running through it has been polluted for 200 years, uh, everything from tanneries to, you know, auto crushing places and chemical plants. And it's been designated for cleanup and what they're going to do eventually is they're going to cement over the bottom and dredge it and start over again. And I'm sure it's going to be beautiful. The developers have already bought all the land on both sides in anticipation of this. But we asked ourselves, hey, if Craig Venter could sail the seven seas and ExxonMobil would give him $400 million to sequence all this life in the, in the ocean, we could sail the Gowanus Canal and see what was in this horrible polluted muck. And who knows, these extremophiles might have some interesting genes. Maybe they're good at, at cleaning up waste. They're certainly living in it. So we set out to do this project. And then when we, we started, we didn't really have a clear um, feeling of who would want to partner with us. And it was pretty amazing. The first partnership was the landscape architecture firm that this gentleman, who was the Gen Space member who was interested in the canal, is part of. And they volunteered to do sort of publicity and graphics, and also they want to make a permanent installation along the canal of some kind to document the work, which is really exciting. And not only that, uh, this is actually one of their beautiful renderings. That's the canal, and each one of those um, uh, spikes in the air is a graphic representation of the microbiome of that part of the canal. And so, uh, you know, in, in, a, in a perfect world when this is actually online, you would be able to um, expand that bar and see what percentage of all these different organisms was at that site. And we partnered with a group at um, uh, the uh, Cornell Medical uh, School, um, their, their computational genomics facility. They're doing something called Pathomap, which is the microbiome of New York City. And I don't know if the news hit here, but in New York it was pretty big news that someone had swabbed all the subways, and there's now a map online of all the subway stations and what sort of uh, pathogens they found in all the subway stations. So uh, we were actually folded into that project, so these are actually deep sequencing runs, which would have been very expensive for us to, to pay for. And they were happy to partner with us. They thought it was great that we were collecting these samples, and we also can collect metadata on it. So we have data from the canal. There are eight different community organizations that love this canal. So there's data on everything from the different uh, water levels to the, the levels of, 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 of salt, because it goes from salt to fresh water. And so this is, this is actually now published work. It was published in the first issue of a new journal uh, from Cell called Cell Systems. 
And it was the first time that GenSpace was listed as an institutional affiliation on an actual scientific paper. So I was really happy about that. Um, this was an example of tinkering. This is our uh, wet pong, a paramecium game. So on that little uh, slide are live paramecia, and a camera is monitoring them. And there are actually two sets of electrodes and if paramecia have this habit of, of homing towards a negative charge, so you can actually kind of herd them on, on the slide by switching the charge. And if you capture the images and overlay them over a game, you can actually have a game being played by live organisms. And so this was sort of a cute little way to kind of get people engaged in both the electronics, the programming, and um, the organism, uh, originally by a professor at Stanford. So we partnered with him but this is an example of sort of a device build. Uh, there's also been labs that have reversed engineered lab equipment. And last summer, uh, one of the members who was part of this um, technology program at an art school uh, in the city started getting interested in, he, he knew 3D printers very well. And he thought, well, why not try to reverse engineer a liquid handling robot on the basis of a 3D printer? Now, these liquid handling robots are usually hundreds of thousands of dollars, the TCANs and the Biomex. He built a version that's $2,000, so it's 100 times cheaper. It is, it, the accuracy is the accuracy of the pipetter itself, and this is the first actual startup company out of GenSpace. So now you have people coming in and inventing things and getting venture capital funding. They want an accelerator. They were sent to Shenzhen, China, where um, they re redesigned it so it could be scaled for mass manufacture. This is, this, is, this is now turned into a serious business. They're delivering their first 50 units in a couple of months. So that's what that morphed into, playing around with technology, morphed into a startup. Uh, now we also have people that are doing biotech startups. And this is this kind of a fuzzy picture. I couldn't find the one. This was from an article I did for Techonomy, that uh, magazine that was called uh, The New Biohackers, How and Where They Work. So these two gentlemen, one is a patent lawyer, and the other is a, a biotechnologist from way back. And one of them had an idea for a product based on RNA. And he's, he's doing some prototyping in the GenSpace lab. And the, and the other is a patent lawyer, and he was fascinated, again, about learning about the technology hands-on. And they had lunch. In the space here is next to Gen Space. It's a communal sort of lunch area for the floor. And they started talking. And the exchange of information on both sides was amazing because the, um, the biologist thought he was going to teach the lawyer something about biology. But he, he ended up learning all this really important stuff about patenting what he was doing. So that's another really cool thing is that you get people that would charge a lot for their pre professional services on the outside. but because they're engaged in this community, they're like, oh, sure, yeah, I'll give you free advice. So it's a good way to, to kind of swap skills. If you, it's like barter skills. Um, we went from doing relatively simple sort of DNA extraction projects also to now being included on people's NSF grants. So uh, Harris Wang, this isn't Harris, by the way. <laughs> this is just a random picture of a real researcher. I couldn't find a picture of Harris. Um, at Columbia at PNS has a, a, a project where he's looking at the microbiome of the gut, and there are a lot of bacteria that we don't really know a lot about, and we don't know how to transform them. And his feeling is that in the future, we'll take some of those gut bacteria and engineer them to either counter medical conditions or be diagnostic or whatever. And so to pave the way for that, he's trying to figure out how to work with them. Because you don't want to work with something like E. coli, which exchanges its DNA all over the place. Some of them don't exchange DNA with other organisms. You want to work with something like that. So he's got, um, he's got this procedure that's really simple, where you just take this weird clay called sepiolite, and you literally rub the DNA onto the bacteria on the plate. And the little shards of the sepiolite puncture the outside of the bacteria, and some of them get transformed. So he wants to try and do this technology and work out the ideal conditions for a number of different strains. And he doesn't have the manpower in his lab. 
So we are going to be his outreach component for his NSF grant, and we are also going to do a lot of this hands-on work with people at GenSpace. So now we are helping an academic scientist reach his goal because he needs manpower to do stuff that his students might find boring, but the people at GenSpace find very exciting. So that's another really good reason. Um, I could go on and on. I hope I haven't bored anyone just sort of doing this cataloging of all these things, but I'm still just totally gobsmacked that this, this lab that when we started it, we all kicked in like $100 and rented the space. We had no idea who was going to use it or what it was going to be good for. We had hopes, but we never could have really predicted where it would go. And I think that uh, to tie it back into the library, uh, we've been speaking a little, and one of the trends now in libraries is that books can be digitized, but the space that the library occupies is very precious. And why not repurpose that space to expand the role of the library to be um, a place that uh, has not only knowledge that you can read about, but knowledge that you can gain hands-on. And uh, engaging uh, communities like the maker community with 3D printers has already happened in a lot of libraries. But there are some things that you can do, particularly just the DNA analysis, like the barcoding. You could do that on a kitchen table. It's just grinding up a plant or, or food and, and extracting DNA and sending it out, amplifying it with PCR and sending it out for sequencing. So I think that these, these, these sites could be sites of public engagement in the biosciences as, as well, which I think is very exciting, because the more places do this in more unconventional environments, the better it's going to be. And of course, I have to show this slide at the end. <laughs> this is my favorite slide. Uh, it was actually taken at the Biohacker Space Boss Lab in Boston. And when I gave my TED talk, I got an email from the mother of this kid. And he was just over the moon. He was like showing all his friends that he was in this video. But I, I really do like the, 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 um, the playful image on the t-shirt. Stand back, I'm going to try science. I think everybody should try science. You might not like it. And that's, that's valuable information, too, particularly if you're a student. Uh, you don't want to spend your whole uh, career prepping for something and then finding out that you don't really like it. Better if you find out you don't like research right off and change what you're doing. At any rate, uh, that's about it. I don't have a, a great, yes, a great last word.